Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, the title of the message is Hope and Assurance in the Gospel. Hope and Assurance in the Gospel. I know uh, the one featured in the Gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ, but I think I already had a message called Hope in Christ Alone. Hope and Assurance in Christ Alone, so I changed the title so people don't get those messages confused. Not like I'm going to say anything different in this message, right? I'm not going to come up with a new assurance. Colossians 1 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, and to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we had heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has in all of the world, and it is bearing fruit, even also among you, since the day that you heard and fully knew the grace of God in truth. Even as you learned from, even as you learned from Epaphras, our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ for you. He also, having shown your love in the Spirit to us, for this cause we also, since the day we've heard, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God." being empowered with all power according to the might of His glory, to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks to the Father who has made us meet or qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. For He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom... His dear Son, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Christ, the firstborn of all creation, for all things were created by Him, uh, things in the heavens and things on earth and the visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that He may be preeminent in all things. For it pleased the Father that in Him all fullness should dwell. And through him, having made peace through the blood of his cross, it pleased the Father to reconcile all things to himself through him, whether it be things on earth or things in heaven. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and without blemish and without charge in his sight." if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So we're going to talk about the hope and assurance in the gospel this morning. And I just want to um, talk about the connection between the gospel and assurance, basically. The doctrine of salvation, assurance, is directly related to the gospel itself. 
assurance and the gospel cannot be separated. Have we, have we, we've said many times before, and we've got into this subject concerning assurance, we said that wherever your assurance is will show the object of your faith. Your assurance is in the object of your faith. So if you have assurance in yourself, then you are the object of your faith, and you think that you have affected salvation in some way. So again, salvation cannot be separated from one that has assurance in it. So, doubting salvation is not evidence of salvation. I've heard this, I don't know how many times, that doubting salvation is evidence that you are saved. And they usually try to say, because you're concerned for your salvation, that you doubt your salvation. Some uh, would say that it is some form of humility that is evidence that you're saved. I, I don't see that in Scripture. I see the very opposite. And saying that, I'm not saying that our assurance is absolutely pristinely perfect all the time. If it had to be, I don't think there'd be anybody saved. So how can doubting one's salvation be evidence of salvation when we, if we were asked, we would say, what's the evidence of salvation? We would say faith. But then you have somebody saying, no doubt, which is the opposite. It does not make sense. And hopefully that'll, that whole thing will be unpacked here uh, throughout this message. So how important is assurance of salvation? Well, I ask uh, in a connection I put together a second ago, how much in, of importance is the object of faith? Because the two are tied together. Uh, we, we teach here, and I've said it many times, that the easiest false gospel to detect, it should be elementary to detect, is a false gospel that says a person who is a believer can lose their salvation. That is a false gospel. That, that message has fallen short of grace as it says in Galatians, you have fallen from grace. That doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. That means you haven't got to grace yet. You've missed the mark. You fell short. You're not at grace yet. Because losing one's salvation is based on works. And the law is present in that scenario, in that scheme. So it's right back to that very basic elementary principle of grace, that salvation is not by works. When sincere but deceived people add works to grace, we know that it's another gospel. Paul's clear, uh, Galatians 1, 6 through 9. We know according to Romans eleven six 6, that grace is canceled out when mixed with works for salvation. These are, these are kindergarten ideas. But how often... Um, do you hear it and see it in many different forms and it tries to creep into people's lives these ideas that turn some part, no matter how small, into a conditional performance-based system that would lean on this idea of, of fear and guilt and condemnation. Uh, maybe not in Sovereign Grace Calvinistic reform circles of losing one's salvation, but at least proving itself out whether one is truly saved in the first place. That's the way they change a little bit. You won't lose your salvation, but if you don't perform to this certain standard, and depending on what denomination you go to, the standard is flexible, then it just proves out, well, you weren't, you weren't saved in the first place. There's a current example that I've that I could give um, concerning something that's been really hot on social media uh, concerning a very, very famous singer, um, Kanye West. Um, earlier this year, he claimed that he had some type of a conversion experience. And I heard about it and um, 
you hear about those things all the time. But what grabbed my attention was that I heard that the guy that he's getting his doctrinal information from was a guy that's trained at John MacArthur Seminary. So my ears perked up, you know, that I became interested in, okay, well, let's see what Kanye West is saying. Let's see what that pastor that's giving him information, let's see how he's talking. So I found some things of some live performances of Kanye West, and then he brought this guy up and let him preach for um, 15 minutes, I think. And uh, some ridiculous statements came out of his mouth. Some Armenian type statements. Of course, we would expect um, common grace and well men offer universal love, and, and that's the stuff that came out. <clears throat> so, as we would see examples of this, now I'm, I'm gearing this toward assurance of salvation and identifying believers. Um, if we're discerning who is and who is not a believer, we start out with ourselves. This whole idea of discerning this, people say, why do you always have to do that? Well, it's two-pronged. We're to beware of false prophets, and then if we're to seek fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to identify those brothers and sisters in Christ. So we identify them the way we identify ourselves. We start with ourselves, the proper criteria for identifying who a believer is, is it law or is it gospel? Those are the two choices. And we know that it's by the gospel. It's the confession of the gospel. What Christ do you trust? What did he do? You start asking those gospel questions. How can uh, a man be just with God? How can God be just and justify the ungodly? What is the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel? These, these questions that we talk about every week here. Well, you can, you can imagine how those that were like the Reformed Calvinist Sovereign Grace people that are like lordship people that um, um, talk about the law as a rule of life, you can imagine how they would look at this situation with Kanye West. We're looking for what, what's his gospel. They're looking for, all right, we're going to put him under a microscope. We're going to see how he performs under the law. We're going to see if he progressively gets better, if he behaves. So we've got two camps of people looking at this person for two different reasons, in two different ways. And um, my suspicion was right. I went and looked at some of the lordship types, and they were putting out videos about it, and it, that's what it was all about. It was all about putting him under the microscope and seeing if he progressively improves through behavior modification. <clears throat> so do you see how people who use much of our theological language will require something totally different than what we would be looking for for evidence of salvation? So we can break it down easily this way. So um, looking at the gospel, these other people would and I've heard them, and I've dealt with them, corresponded with them, they would look at the gospel in a very broad and generic way. We did three messages on it. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. The historical event of this historical person. And we look at the true gospel of uh, justification by Christ's righteousness based on his accomplished redemption for his people. And methods and mess, uh, the message and the methods flow consistently from that gospel we believe. They don't care how that he died, for who that he died, what his death accomplished. Those questions aren't talked about. It's, you know, just that death, burial, resurrection, which we know Catholics believe, Mormons believe, Jehovah's Witnesses believe, Seventh day Adventists believe, Christian Science believes. We could go on and on and on. So this is important in for yourself identifying what the gospel is that you believe. So when you fellowship with people, you can fellowship um, with actual believers. And then the law-keeping side of it is that they would use the law to 
as their primary source for measuring salvation, you know, how they behave. We have talked in the past how that we know that even uh, atheists can change and can improve and do in men's eyes good things. Um, drunks can stop drinking, heroin addicts can stop shooting heroin. Uh, I, I know both that have done that. Many people that have stopped doing bad things that people would look at as evidence. So then we would, we would look at the law and we know, first of all, from the scripture and from our own experience that um, we can't keep the law even after conversion. And if we judge people that that way concerning law keeping, then we are automatically condemning ourselves because we don't keep the law. Romans 2 says that. So there are probably some people listening um, that are just like by now just completely shocked by what I've said so far. And I, and I have a suspicion that those people might be the people that use these type sentences. And I'm going to give about six or seven sentences here. They would say, you are not saved if you knowingly have sin in your life. <laughs> I mean, that you could go on the rest of the message just saying, seriously, if you knowingly have sin in your life, so that is someone the right there that has not heard the law. They don't realize what the requirements of the law are. They would also say, you are not saved if you are not winning the battle over the power of sin, the victorious Christian life. I don't know what considered winning the battle would be, uh, winning more often than not. 51-49, I guess you're okay. I don't know. You are not saved if, you ha if there is a pattern of sin in your life. Most people you ask, they will say that they sin, they'll at least admit they sin one, uh, uh, once a day. But most people that are honest, they say, I can't keep track. So are there days or weeks that they don't sin to break that pattern? These are people that would say, you're not saved if you have a habit of sinning. That goes along with the last line. You're not saved if you willfully sin. I know there's a bunch of people just running around unwillfully sinning all the time and they don't, don't know it, don't mean to. And you are not saved if you practice sin. And that's a biblical idea. We just have to define what it means to practice sin. And we have here before. But when they say practice sin, they mean it like all those other sentences that I just gave you. So those are the things that, you know, later we'll, we'll look, get into in the message. And they affect the conscience. All this, you can't separate the conscience from assurance. The conscience is in the forefront. You either have an uncleansed conscience or you have a cleansed conscience. So we'll, uh, we'll get into that. So the, the conscience and assurance will fluctuate and it'll make people not feel saved. You ever heard that talk? Do you feel saved? Or somebody asks if a person is saved and they say, I don't feel like it. So if... Uh, and, and when I start this uh, conversation about assurance, I don't want to lead people to think that we're defending people's assurance of salvation that aren't saved. I want to make a note here that if a person is not a believer and they don't have assurance of salvation, you know what? That's good. They shouldn't <laughs> because they're not saved, right? So we're not promoting some type of a just patting people on the back and promoting them and, and just so their self-esteem and Fears will go, you know, their self-esteem will be fine and their fears will go away. That's not even love. That's continuing them in their deception. But if you're a believer and you doubt your salvation, you need to check your gospel. That's the problem. There's a problem with where the object of your faith is. 
And this is not to um, scold anybody that has doubts. It's to train people to look to the right place so you don't have doubts. So here's some basic ideas. Two of them. Concerning what I just said about a person might not feel saved. Number one. Feelings and emotions are not a safe foundation for anything, especially salvation. Because why? They change. They change based on some things that are not even related to salvation. They change on circumstances. And you can't read circumstances. But emotions or feelings are not a safe foundation. That is not walking by faith, that's walking by sight. And Scripture tells us not to do that. Secondly, it obviously shows that a person needs to stop leaning on themselves because there might be a dab of that in their thoughts. Stop trusting in yourself. They say, well, I'm, I'm, not, doubting, I'm not doubting Christ, I doubt me. Yeah, you should. Why, you, why even look to even measure that? That's total depravity. You better doubt yourself. You have no hope in yourself. So this again is getting the gospel straight. Check your gospel. So as for both of those facts, um, they're not something that we can build on if we're wrong on those things, if we trust our feelings and emotions and we're trusting ourselves, we can't, we can't even build on those. That's a shaky foundation. We need to understand something that is more sure and certain. Think the word sure and certain has anything to do with assurance? So here are the basic questions you ask yourself at the next level. Once you've seen, well, that's foolishness. I don't need to think that way anymore. Feelings and looking to myself which that implicates more than half of Sovereign Grace Calvinistic Reform religion, because that's what they're always looking at. Easily more than half. So here are the things to, to ask yourself. Do you believe God and what he has said about salvation? I mean, doesn't it boil down to just that idea? Do you believe God? What has he said? Do you believe him? And then... More specific, is the merit of Christ's accomplished death sufficient to save by itself? That's, that's as, as simple as you can put it. If you don't believe what God says concerning the merits of the accomplished death of Christ to save by itself, have you believed the gospel? Now, Keep those thoughts in mind, and I want to um, read some bad stuff, which we do sometimes, to show that we need to stay away from these ideas. What does the Catholic Church say about assurance of salvation? Now, after I read a couple things about what they say, we're going to drift down to some, quote-unquote, Protestants or Calvinists, what they say. And you might not see much difference. You probably th knew that was coming, right? Cardinal, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, some guy from way back, he was some real high up theologian, said concerning assurance of salvation, he said, it's a prime error of heretics. He was against assurance altogether. From the Council of Trent, I think that was in 1600 sometimes, it's, there's a statement there. It says, if anyone <clears throat> says that he will for certain uh, of an absolute infallibility and certainty have the gift of perseverance unto the end, let him be anathema. So, no assurance. You can't have assurance. From... Catholic Answers website on assurance, it says this. This is a current website that's run by officially some Catholic organization that speaks with 
the authority of the Catholic Church to promote their dogma, says this about assurance. How can we actually know that we are going to heaven? Well, in a sense, the Bible does guarantee salvation to those who want it bad enough, but on certain conditions. It is not as simple as uh, believing in Jesus as Savior. Faith alone is not enough. Faith without works is dead, and Jesus said that he will know his people by their fruits and not just their profession. It is true that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, but the scripture also says we must do the will of God. We are to love our fellow humans as God does by what we do, by our actions, by our deeds, by our works. If we do all this with the help of God's grace, then we will be saved. Unquote. Here's a, <clears throat> a second quote, last quote, from uh, the same website. It's a tract that they put together on assurance. It says, Catholics are portrayed uh, as if they must every moment be in terror of losing their salvation since Catholics recognize that it is possible to lose salvation through mortal sin. But this portrayal is in error. Catholics do not live uh, lives of mortal terror, terror concerning salvation. True, salvation can be lost through mortal sin, but such sins are by nature grave ones and not the kind that a person living the Christian life is going to slip into committing on the spur of the moment without deliberate thought and consent. Neither does the Catholic Church teach that one cannot have assurance of salvation. This is true both of present and future salvation. So as, <laughs> there's a lot of giveaways through there, right? And there's a bunch of stuff should be popping up in your mind. But uh, we'll go on and we'll get away from the Catholic Church and let's see what John Piper has said concerning assurance of salvation. How can a person be right with God? The stunning Christian answer is faith alone. But be sure you hear this carefully and precisely. That's why I copied it and pasted it. I didn't retype it or listen and dictate it. It's a copy and paste. He is right with God by faith alone, not attaining heaven by faith alone. There are other conditions for attaining heaven, but no others for entering a right relationship to God. In fact, one must already have a right relationship with God by faith alone in order to meet the other conditions. And then another separate sentence, he wrote, he wrote this. In final salvation at the last judgment, faith is confirmed by the sanctifying fruit it has borne, and we are saved through that fruit and that faith. All right, now, lastly, these are some things that I typed out from listening to a John MacArthur video, seven minutes and ten seconds on a question and answer session by a young lady asked the question. Her name was Joy. I, you know, I've posted this on a church page before. And he spent seven minutes and ten seconds, and he didn't bring up the death of Christ one time. He didn't bring up Christ's righteousness one time. Said nothing about Christ, the cross, righteous, nothing. And I just typed some highlights here. And if you want to look at it in its context, I can send you the link again, or you can look it up. But all you got to type in is on YouTube is John MacArthur Q&A on assurance. It'll come up. Her name's Joy. And she was crying when she was asking questions. And his answers just got me angry. Every time I watch the video, I just get more angry. He says, the way you know you are saved is by your desire. So he asked the questions to Joy. He says, do you desire to know God? Yes. Do you desire that he would know you and love you? Yes. Do you desire to love him? Yes. Do you desire to honor him? Yes. 
do you desire to obey his word? And she says, yes, but I can't do it without his help. And then the conversation went on from there. But there were some other statements here that I had written down. And shortly after that, he said, unregenerate enemies of God don't have those desires. Now, I guarantee you, those questions he asked, all false religion has those desires. They're deceived. The guy that said at the end, Lord, Lord, have I not done that? He had those desires. No doubt about it. He was serious. He goes on, God accepts us if we love him, and he calls on us to love him more. Security is one thing. Security means that I'm saved and he will keep me. I'm secure in him. That's not assurance. Assurance is confidence I have in my mind of my salvation, which I have no idea why he would separate those two. It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, lastly, a confession of faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith on Assurance. It says, This infallible assurance does not belong to the essence of faith, which I vehemently disagree with, that first line, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he is a partaker in it, a partaker in assurance. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation in various ways shaken, diminished, intermitted, as by the negligence of preserving it, by falling into some special sin. What's that sound like? It kind of sounds like what the Catholic guy was talking about. Um, by some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and the suffering, even such as fear him, walk in darkness and have no light, yet are they never so utterly destitute that the seed of God and the life of faith and the love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived. There's a lot said there. So I think you got kind of the gist of it. I believe that, um, and I've said for a long time, that um, assurance is the essence of faith. And I know that there might be even some confusion about what that means. And We've had discussions about this over lunch before. But let's look at a few of these verses here in our context. Verse 1, or chapter 1 and verse 3. I want us to see a few things as we go along here, and we're thinking about assurance here. We give thanks to our God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, praying always from you, since we heard of, notice this, your faith in Jesus Christ, and the love, here's the fruit of it that flows from it, and the love that you have to all the saints. Here's what I want us to see here. For the hope, that word means confident expectation. It's used in different ways other places, but this is the word that means confident expectation. For the hope, notice this, which is laid up for you in heaven, of which ye heard before, whereat, what was the means? In the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you. That gospel was sent to you, of course, by the providence of God. How can they hear unless they, it's the, uh, the, uh, it be preached? And how can they preach it unless they've been sent? As it was in all the world, and bearing fruit, gospel always does, to believers, even also among you since the day you heard and fully knew the grace of God in truth. So here we see that there is this confident expectation that is, notice, laid up for you out of your reach. <laughs> we know about the providence and the predestination and the, the decree of God. All these things were set in motion. Before we were born, before the world was created, we had nothing to do. It was out of our hands. It was outside of us. This is objective truth. God says all throughout his scripture that took place. Promises were made in the covenant. All these things were done. He didn't ask us about it. He did it. And I'm glad because those of us that believe the gospel are in on it. We can't affect it. 
nobody can uh, uh, that has been affected by it. We can't change it. We can't mess it up. Uh, those that are enemies, uh, including Satan, can't get to it, can't affect it. You know, all those verses like, you know, who can lay anything to charge of God's elect, and so on. So we have this confident expectation. It, this is like a presuppositional idea. We presuppose what he's saying about this is true, and it's not going to be affected. And this is something that, of course, a lot of the Armenians say, well, nobody's going to pluck you out of your father's hand, but you can. This rules this out. This silly idea. As if you would want to anyway, being indwelt by the Spirit and being enlightened by the Gospel. You want to go back to darkness from light? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? That's insanity. So we can have assurance in some of that language there. If you would turn to chapter 3 of the same book, Colossians 3, uh, there's some language here that complements this, harmonizes with it. Kind of just piles on the assurance idea. Verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Well, we know why he's sitting there, right? Because the successful sacrifice was accepted. He was raised. He ascended. And now he's exalted because of this accomplished redemption that we're looking to. That's why he's sitting there. It is a seat of authority because of his accomplishment. And he's right now he's praying for us. And we know God answers his prayers. Verse 2, be mindful of these, uh, be mindful of things above. Uh, talking about what he just mentioned. He's not talking about little fat baby angels flying around with halos. All that superstitious stuff. He's talking about look to Christ. Not on those things of, that are on earth. For you died, and here's why I brought us here, and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. That's safety. Christ the mediator, the advocate, the representative, the substitute, successfully accomplished his mission. He's at the right hand of the Father, and his people, we could just go back and read John 17. You remember John 17, all those things in there of security that were read about who we are in him, and because we're in him, we have fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, and us in him, and him in us, and here it is right here. We're hidden with Christ in God. This is another way of saying that we're accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in the person of another. When Christ, our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. So we'll see Him face to face one day, and this will be um, the final part of redemption in our glorification. Go to, go to Ephesians 1. I know you hate going to Ephesians 1 and getting some good stuff, some good uh, blessings in Christ that are listed here. We'll start in verse 7. We know we've been talking a bajillion messages about chosen in Christ. So I'm taking it that you're gonna, you've got those memorized, so go ahead and, and superimpose those in your brain and come down to verse 7. In Him we have redemption, speaking of Christ, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He caused to abound toward us in all wisdom and understanding. Having made known to us, this wipes out the ignorance, the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, and we spend a lot of time on this phrase right here, which He purposed in Himself, sovereignly, 
for the administration of the fullness of time to head up all things in Christ where they belong, where they've purposed to be headed up in, both the things of heaven and the things of earth, even in Him, in whom, in Christ, we have been chosen to an inheritance predestinated according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His own will, for us to be the praise of His glory, who previously had trusted in Christ, in whom also, hearing the word of truth, same phrase that was used in the other text we looked at, word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also believing, here it is, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Security. This is something that was done for you that you can't stop. And again, you know, who in their right mind would want to stop it? it? I'm just saying you can't affect it. You can't go back and undo it by things that you're not doing correctly. You're sealed. God is doing the sealing. And it speaks of the Spirit who is the earnest of our inheritance to the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. The sealing is to His glory. He predetermined it. He did it. He controls it. He guards it. It's in heaven laid up for you, like the other text says. So there was a deal made before time by God in the covenant that we had no part in. And we can't affect it. <clears throat> Nobody else can affect it. And it was an agreement in reference to the will of God that Christ would come and faithfully execute in every detail according to all the conditions. Are there conditions of salvation? Yes, there are, but they're on Christ. The conditions and the demands of God through His holiness, He's faithful to His own character, the demands and requirements of His law and justice to be completed by Christ for salvation, which is to establish a perfect righteousness for His people by His accomplished death. So having seen that, which I think we've seen it in many ways, in many times, I ask the question in reference to assurance. Have you found your complete rest in the faithfulness of Christ's finished work? It just keeps getting back to these basic questions again. Are you resting in Christ? Can you trust Him to rest in Him? Is His work sufficient? Do you believe God about it? Whenever you're caused by some fool to doubt your salvation, if you believe this gospel, you go back and keep asking yourself that gospel question. Is his death sufficient? Do you believe God about it? That's, that's about as basic as you can get about it. I mean, that's, that's the issue. Is his accomplished redemption, propitiation, reconciliation by the blood of his cross, is it enough? Is it enough? That's what divides true and false religion because false religion says it's not enough and they make you look someplace else to finish and you be the sufficiency. Do you actually believe and understand what he said when he cried out, it is finished? Or maybe it's this. Maybe you can think sarcastically in your mind when you doubt your salvation. You can think, well, maybe it was this that cried out from his mouth. I got it started for you. Now the rest is up to you. Is the, was that his cry? That's a blasphemous thought. So that should make you turn and look in the right way to be assured by it is finished rather than it's not sufficient and you've got to do something. That's a satanic idea. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is going to keep trying to cause you to look inside yourself to doubt that it is finished. So in salvation, is it your commitment or Christ's commitment that you're looking at? In salvation, is it your dedication or maybe rededications that you look at 
or is it Christ's dedication to his perfect sacrifice to the Father? In salvation, is it your faithfulness or Christ's faithfulness that you're looking to for salvation? So, uh, you know, here's a question. You said all that, and the typical reaction is, so you're saying we don't have to be committed, dedicated, or faithful? <laughs> Who heard me say that? Yes, we should be dedicated, committed, and faithful. Of course. And more. But not for any part of salvation. Zero. As a matter of fact, until you know that and understand that, you can't even begin to start to be committed, dedicated, and faithful. Because if you're thinking that you're being dedicated, committed, and faithful as some form or part or condition of your salvation, you're just committing dead works, self-righteousness. So in other words, when you hear the gospel of God's free and sovereign grace and you see that commitment of Christ and the dedication of Christ and Christ's faithfulness, then there will be assurance. And then you can be, you can be, you can have the justification for even following him. When I say justification, I don't, I'm not talking about legally. I'm talking about the reason and the motive for doing it. God is, uh, your, your reason is vindicated for doing things after you see that it's done. Because if you're doing things to finish what he didn't finish, you have no justification for even starting the journey. So we look to him by faith and love and thankfulness, and we serve cheerfully based on the fact that he's done everything to get us to heaven and keep us out of hell so we don't have that motive now to serve, to stay out of hell and get ourselves to heaven. It's a totally different ballgame. That's what's switched when he gives us repentance from dead works, when he grants us repentance from idolatry and self-righteousness and cleanses our conscience and affects our assurance after that. It's a different ballgame. And when that happens, this should set your priorities in your life. Look at Matthew 6. Matthew 6. And uh, verse 19. So I, I read a verse earlier about a treasure that was laid up in heaven for us that we can't get to to affect it or mess it up. Well, look at verse 19 of Matthew. Do not lay your treasures, uh, lay up your treasures on earth for yourselves, where moth and rust corrupts, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up your treasures in heaven for yourselves, where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break in nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I'm not going to break into some kind of rewards message here like a lot of people would. It's just talking about don't think earthy anymore. Your priority is not earthy. Uh, seek ye first these incorruptible things, these things that cannot be taken away, all these things that are tied to the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Don't have anxiety about what's going on down here. <clears throat> but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And God will take care of you like He takes care of the flowers of the field and the sparrows and all those. We're warned in Hebrews anyway that everything else is going to be shaken and removed away and burned. Back in our text, let's look at verse 9. Colossians 1, nine. For this cause also, we since the day we had heard, we do not cease to pray for you and desire that you may be filled. Look at this anti-ignorant stuff. 
that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being empowered with all power according to His might and His glory and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. It's not like false religion where you're, uh, it's drudgery and bondage. Giving thanks to the Father, notice this, whom has made us meet or qualified to be partakers of his inheritance of the saints in light. For he has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. So God's gospel it will finally and actually cause us to hear the law, what the law says. And we hear it, we hear it well. It says God requires absolute perfection all the time, every time. So we see there's only one that can do that. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel will finally and actually produce a fear. What kind of fear? By way of reverence to God and to His law once we hear the law. By the gospel. Seeing that it was fully obeyed, fulfilled, satisfied, and honored by the only one that could do it, the Lord our righteousness. And the gospel will show you finally and actually that His perfect righteousness demands the full salvation for all those that Christ represented to make them holy and righteous by His doing and dying. That's what we'll finally and actually see. And God causes us to finally and actually see that in the gospel. So then you ask the question, of course, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish it. Romans uh, 3 says that. And we establish it that way, the way, I just, the way I just read about it, by finally and actually seeing all these things fulfilled in Christ in the gospel. That is what verse 9 is talking about when it says, be filled with the knowledge of His will and wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's what it's talking about. And that's what it means the only way when it says to walk worthy in the Lord, pleasing and being fruitful in every work and increasing in the knowledge of our God. So, I mean, you're not worthy in yourself, are you? The worthiness has to be outside yourself if you hear what the law says. And then it, says, it talks about um, walking worthy with the Lord and all pleasing. What is pleasing to God? Hebrews, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Is that just faith itself? No, it's the object of our faith. Christ is always pleasing to God. And we know that believers are always and only accepted in Christ. With that in mind, then, uh, and only, can a person be fruitful in every work because we do the works right? We're pretty good at doing the works. The only way that anything that we do is accepted is because we're accepted in Him. We're in Christ, hidden in God. And that's the only way that in verse 11 where it says, being empowered with all power according to His might and glory to all patience and long-suffering and joyness with, with joyfulness. Who is the one doing the empowering? The Spirit of God effectually works in His people. We know this. To will and to do of His good pleasure. And He said, you know what? The work that I'm going to begin in you, I'm going to finish it until the day of Christ. So this is done for His people because of what Christ... Uh, it's done in His people because of what Christ did for His people. And that's because of what uh, Christ said here. He said, we give thanks to the Father that's made us meet or qualified to be partakers of the inheritance in light. How did He make us qualified? Listen to this verse. You don't have to turn there. This is one I expect you to memorize too, maybe. You should. 
1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's how you're made qualified. And that's the whole reason that in verse 13 it says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Has there been a change? You don't think that line describes a change? This turns your world upside down. You've passed from death into life. You've gone from one category to the other. You've gone from enemies of God to you're reconciled to God. God has given you repentance, which is a change of mind. Yes, something has changed. You think the opposite now. You have divested everything that is in you, and you realize that the only, only way that you're accepted is in the person and work of Christ. To think otherwise is to be in darkness. I've got a bunch of other verses here on um, assurance. I'm not going to read them. Save them for another time, another message. But this thing of assurance is very, very important. It's as important as the gospel itself. And these people that are preaching doctrines that would cause you to think that you are doing something as a condition to, to gain the favor of God or stay in the favor of God or finally in the end be in the favor of God, these people are nothing short of wicked they're false preachers. It's, it's affecting people's lives. They're evil. And um, we, we ought not be afraid to call that out. And when we see our assurance in Christ, as I said before, this is our very incentive to serve Him, to worship Him, to do all the things that He says to do. That is our new platform to work from. We're not mercenaries. We don't serve for reward or money or we don't serve out of fear, the dread quaking fear type. We serve out of a reverential fear, seeing God's both a just God and Savior. We, we know there's a sense in which we owe a debt to Him but we know that Christ paid that debt. But we owe a debt of love. And the love of Christ constrains us to serve. But this stuff where these ideas of directing our eyes off of Christ, the one who did everything and the one who's the preeminent one, and to cause us to look any place else, and I'm telling you, it's all over the place. It's the vast majority of preaching on assurance. They want you to look in. And those men are hirelings. They're liars. Any questions or comments? Any questions or comments about feeling saved? I thought that would, and that's one of the first things I said, and I know by the time we got to the end, you might have forgot it, but anybody ever hear that kind of thing? And maybe a long time ago, you might have thought it. I don't know, a long time ago, five minutes ago? Did anybody think that? I don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> upon the, the authority of the Word of God, I'm telling you, don't do that. Feelings aren't going to get you anywhere uh, but confused. Confused. 